Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Hakula, a professor at the USC Price School of Public Policy at the University of Southern California. And today I'm going to talk to you about chapter three from my book, China from a US Policy Perspective. Chapter three is China from a US Trade Policy Perspective. So let's get to it. Trade has been a centerpiece of American policy for a long time, certainly hearkening back to President Calvin Coolidge. One of his more memorable lines is that the chief business of the American people is business. They're profoundly concerned with producing, buying, selling, investing, and prospering in the world. And that's as true today, almost 100 years later, as it was when he spoke to us. Now, why is trade so important? Well, there are several facets of it. There's a macroeconomic level, where it's a key component of GDP. Strategic dimension, as our bilateral and global alliances are often focused around trade issues. At a micro level, microeconomic level, it's important because international trade become, is incorporated into the very production function of, uh, by which we produce goods and services. And at the household level, uh, international trade is important both in our role as consumers, because we have access to goods that are produced around the world, and in our role as employees. Uh, because this international trade reshapes the context in which our own work occurs and how that fits into these global trade patterns. So what drives this international trade? Well, the, for the longest time, the, the main theory about comparative of international trade was that of comparative advantage associated with the name of Ibn Ricardo. And Ricardo, uh, was about two centuries ago, uh, formulated this notion of comparative advantage, uh, whereby countries that engage in trade, um, essentially each one focuses on that one in which it has a comparative advantage, in which it's uh, the opportunity cost of producing good A uh, is lower. In a sense, the production of another unit of good A is uh, calls for giving up less of good B than it would for the other country, and the reverse when looked at from the other way around. And so if both countries focus and specialize on those goods for which they have a comparative comparative advantage, then when we look from a, an aggregate perspective, there are gains from trade that you have some advantage because you focused on what you're good at, we do likewise, and if we trade, we can somehow share the uh, advantage, the, the net surplus or gain that comes from uh, us specializing in this way. But towards the end of the 20th century, it uh, became increasingly clear that, in fact, most global trade was occurring, for example, between the United States and Europe. And there it was more difficult to use comparative advantage to explain why so much trade was taking place. And so another theory began to emerge, which focused on scale economies. The idea here is that, well, look, you and I, say, Europe and we, the US, uh, both have similar uh, industrial structures. And so there's not too much comparative advantage one way or the other. But if you focus on good A and we focus on good B, we'll both achieve scale economies and then we can trade uh, and still get mutual gain from that. Now, one of the names most closely associated with this newer explanation for what drives international trade is Paul Krugman, who won the Nobel Prize for this and other work 
And in his acceptance speech, 2009, he looked back at this issue and he said that for the last two decades, however, the trend has been in the other direction with rapidly rising trade between advanced economies and much poorer, lower wage economies, especially China. Nobody doubts that trade between the United States and Mexico where wages are only 13% of the US level or China where they are only about 4%, this was at the time Krugman was speaking, reflects comparative advantage rather than arbitrary scale-based specialization. The old trade theory has regained relevance. So here's one of the more prominent voices about the scale economies uh, explanation for what drives world trade, saying that in the case of China and its emergence, because it's the structure of its economy is so different because the wages there are so low compared to what they are in the United States or many other developing, developed countries, uh, that comparative advantage argument of Ricardo uh, has regained uh, prevalence. Now we can see from this graphic what indeed has been happening. The merchandise trade balance, which is good in the trade in physical goods and commodities, uh, not including services, has uh, steadily, our trade deficit with China, merchandise trade deficit has steadily grown uh, over, the, over the past decades. And this has indeed been cause for some concern. And it, this graphic is um, quite startling in that it shows that our merchandise trade deficit with China is almost exactly equivalent to our merchandise, the aggregate of our merchant uh, merchandise trade deficit with the next 10 countries combined, Mexico, Germany, Japan, etc. So this has really created a sort of a new world, a new context. So one question that arises in this context is, does China play by the rules? And this is from a Congressional Research Service report, which summarizes some of the issues that many policymakers feel arise in the context of this burgeoning uh, merchandise trade deficit with China. Major areas of concern expressed by US policymakers and stakeholders include China's alleged widespread cyber economic espionage against US firms, relatively ineffective record of enforcing intellectual property rights, discriminatory innovation policies, mixed record on implementing its WTO uh, obligations, extensive use of industrial policies such as subsidies and trade and investment barriers to promote and protect industries that are favored by the government, and interventionist policies to influence the value of its currency. So that's the sort of wrap on China by those in the United States who feel that this outcome of persist growing and persistent trade deficits with China are the result of China's not fault working by the rules. So the first of those, or one of those uh, issues, and this received more prominence uh, some years back, it's receiving less prominence now, and so I'll pay less attention to it in uh, this particular lecture, it has to do with this currency manipulation. So let's go right down to this quote from the bottom. This is a nice paper by Steger and Sykes, uh, one of whom is a legal scholar, the other is an economics uh, professor. And the, combined then, they're looking both at the economic issues and the legal context in which uh, the US might have redress by going to WTO and saying, look, China's not playing by the rules and we want the WTO to step in and remedy this. And they argue that, I won't go through the text, you can read it yourself as you're looking at this, but their basic argument is, it's really difficult to make that case. 
Uh, there aren't too many specific uh, regulations that address currency per se. The idea is that you have to show that one would have to show, the United States, for example, would need to show uh, in a kind of court that a court setting, the WTO uh, arbitration um, context, should demonstrate that by uh, manipulating its currency, by keeping the value of its currency low, China is somehow thwarting the original intent of GATT and WTO. And their basic argument is, it's not an easy case to make. And as I mentioned, it's not one that we hear as much uh, in any rate. Another issue that comes up in this context is um, what is the damage associated with this? Uh, in another uh, Congressional Research uh, Services report, uh, reviewing some of the issues, they point out that we should be thinking about uh, whether we're looking at the perspective of producers or of consumers. According to economic theory, they say, a society's economic well-being is usually measured not by how much it can produce, by how much it can consume. The lasting effect of an undervalued renminbi, the Chinese yuan, is to increase the purchasing power of U.S. consumers. So one could make the argument that, in fact, U.S. consumers are helped by the fact that the U.S. dollar is stronger relative to the RMB and that, therefore, uh, we're in a more powerful position as consumers uh, to, to acquire goods. Now, there's another question about whether or not such an arrangement is sustainable over the long run. Uh, but the, other, the flip side of that is, uh, if we're looking at the U.S. as a producer economy, along with production comes employment. Now, in the lecture that I will give next, which is uh, focusing on chapter four, we look specifically at employment and income. So I won't delve into those details um, on this occasion. Now, a very insightful comment, I think, is by uh, Professor Danny Roderick, who, uh, although this was um, 10 years ago, he made the statement, I think it still has a lot of relevance and I think it's a good clarity to it. He says, he argues that Poor countries become rich by producing what rich countries produce. The reason that under evaluation of the currency works as a powerful force for economic growth is that it acts as a kind of industrial policy by raising the domestic relative price of tradable economic activities. It increases the profitability of such activities within China, for example, and spurs capacity and, and <coughs> excuse me, capacity and employment generation in the modern industrial sectors that are, are the key to growth. So in that paper of his, he essentially argues that it's not unreasonable for a country like China, where there may be uh, institutional shortcomings, for example, capital markets may not allocate uh, savings very well, very efficiently towards those industries, those sectors that have the most promise of growth. And by maintaining uh, a low value for the renminbi, uh, they can in effect spur investment in these uh, sectors that are the key to growth. So the question is whether that's um, allowable under the WTO rules. It may make sense from China's perspective to do that. Is it consistent with WTO rules? And if not, uh, might we achieve some redress through WTO? Well, Wendy Cutler, a uh, former uh, very senior uh, uh, person in the uh, US Trade Representative Office, um, argues that the World Trade Organization would ideally help to reduce friction between US and China, but it is not up to the task given its outdated rules and governance challenges. The crisis points to this deeper problem. 
the failure to keep up with developments in the trading and investment landscape. An equally pressing issue is the WTO's slowness to respond to technological advancements, particularly the digital economy. Simply put, the trade regime is in trouble and in urgent need of reform. This next slide just gives a sense of how messy and cumbersome the process can be. This is a kind of flow chart that, anal that depicts the settlement, dispute settlement process within WTO. That settlement process can drag on, can take quite a bit of time. Um, and by the time something is settled, new issues may have arised or the uh, offending party uh, would uh, adapt its strategy so that it's uh, no longer doing what it was doing, but is doing something else that has the same effect and we're back uh, and playing the game all over again. And as the previous quote observed, technological changes is driving uh, additional changes to the landscape the trading landscape that are quickly making a lot of old rules, some of the prior rules, uh, obsolete. And so if this underlines a more general point, which is that institutions are important, but if institutions fail to work and function properly and effectively, uh, then they can actually become an encumbrance. So, that is clearly the view uh, expressed here by uh, more recently by the US trade representative uh, under the Trump administration, who argues that it is unrealistic to believe that actions at the WTO alone would ever be sufficient to force or persuade China to make fundamental changes to its trade regime. No matter how many cases are brought, at the WTO, China can always find a way to engage in market distorting practices. Accordingly, while the United States will use the WTO where possible and will continue efforts to encourage other countries to work with us at the WTO, the United States must also take action outside the WTO to encourage China to move in a more open and market oriented direction. Now, this that begs another question, which is um, whether this is a kind of an all or nothing proposition, whether we should be working within the context of a WTO that has virtually every country on the planet involved in one set of rules. Another option, another potential approach um, is that of trading blocks and thinking of these trading blocks as clubs there is a subfield of economics called club theory, which I think has a lot of merit to it. And while the, some of the papers that are published in that, in that subfield, like much of the rest of economics are quite mathematical and uh, seemingly complex, the basic idea is fairly straightforward, which is that like most any club, um, there are gains from mutual association in certain circumstances. So rather than pinning our hopes on the idea that there's got to be one WTO that includes all countries, including China, and there's got to be one set of rules and every country must follow these rules or we just abandon it entirely. Um, an intermediate kind of ground is that of the United States working with like-minded trading partners to say, look, this is the way we think trade ought to occur. These are the rules that we think are reasonable for trading regimes. And let's form a club, as it were, a trading block with such countries and do that rather than trying to uh, agonize and wrestle with countries like China, perhaps, that don't see it as being in their interest to uh, work within the framework of WTO in the same way that the United States feels that it should. It's really up to China, not up to the US, to determine what is in its interests. But it's up to the US 
to determine whether we're going to go along or not. So one option is to be working within the WTA framework and to work with China and other countries to reform WTO in a manner that meets the needs of developing countries, including China and developed countries, including the United States in a reasonable and fair way. Uh, and that in many ways is the best possible outcome. It's a little bit like climate change, which we'll look at in chapter five, that climate change uh, also brings to the table, the negotiations over climate change brings to the table countries like the developed countries like the US, developing countries like China, and seeks to work out an equitable and reasonable arrangement by which global objectives may be met through reasonable accommodation uh, on both sides. The same thing could conceivably, could in principle happen within the context of trade. That doesn't mean it necessarily will. It's a question of both both sides working in good faith and reaching a uh, reasonable accommodation. But the, there's no reason that the US should be held to ransom um, over this. So as a second best solution, if the first best solution is not available, looking at these kind of trading blocks while keeping the door open uh, to other countries, including China, who may want to enter this trading block and uh, reach a mutual accommodation, which essentially is working back towards that first best solution. And this was, in effect, what underlay this um, Trans-Pacific Partnership that, uh, in the end, uh, did not move forward with the US participation when the Trump administration came in and uh, rejected this TPP. And without the United States involved in that, uh, it was very difficult for that to get off the ground. So I'll close the discussion of this chapter with just some raising some discussion questions. So rather than my giving you answers, let me raise some questions that uh, may be fodder for additional thought. One is, question of whether WTO has outlived its usefulness, or does it still have an important role to play in adjudicating trade disputes? What WTO reforms, if any, are both necessary and attainable? What should be the role of the United States and of China in designing, advocating for, and implementing any such WTO reforms? A second question is, what are the likely longer run consequences if a WTO-centric global trade order devolves instead into a myriad set of bilateral managed trade agreements. With the world's largest economy, is the United States likely to come out ahead by going it alone or not? Finally, most economists agree that US trade deficits are ultimately a consequence of Americans consuming more than they produce. If so, what policy measures might be taken at the macroeconomic level to address these deficits. So I welcome you to ponder those questions and to join me in my next lecture when I'll be talking about the rise of China and its impact on US employment and income. Thank you for joining me.